Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I can see most people are, are kind of dropping in now. That's OK. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr Jackie Chin. I'm from the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. It used to be known as Public Health England. So welcome to our webinar today on the whole school approach to promoting health and well, uh, promoting mental health and well-being in secondary schools. I'm really pleased to say we have Christy Stroud, who is from the Department for Education, who's going to give us an overview of the whole school approach. And then we've got your colleagues from the Marlebone School in Westminster and from Tolworth Girls School in Kingston. Christy's then going to tell us a little bit about how you can access the mental health training grant. It's quite an informal session, so please do introduce yourselves in chat and say if there's an, in, an area that you're particularly interested in or want to know about. And also there'll be a chance after each presentation to ask some questions. So do you either put your hand up or uh, put the questions in chat. Uh, we'll be sharing the slides afterwards at the end of the session to everybody who has registered. I hope that's OK. Um, if you could just stay on mute unless you're talking, if that's all right. So I'm going to ask Kirsty. Kirsty, do you want to introduce yourself and then we'll make a start? Thanks. Yes. Thanks, Jackie. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen now. There we go. And I'll jump to the right page as well. But hi there. I am Kirsty Stroud. And um, as Jackie just introduced, I work at the Department for Education where we have a mental health delivery division. Um, so we're overseeing trying to get um, more mental health support in schools, which I think everyone on this call will agree is, is very much needed. Um, but my background, though, um, is in schools where I was for 20 years. I was um, a teacher in Islington in North London in a primary school. And um, for the last 10 years of that, I was assistant head and deputy head. And one of the roles I held um, while in Islington as a deputy head was leading on the pastoral provision. Um, so working as the senior mental health lead. So I, I bring that to the table in my role here at the Department of Education. So I thought um, I have about 10 minutes, I think, in the, on the slot today to talk to you and give a bit of an overview about a whole school approach to mental health and wellbeing. Um, if you were on the call yesterday, we held the same session for primary. So my, my talk is very much the same because a lot of the principles apply to primary and secondary, but the talks you'll be hearing from um, leads in schools will be focused on secondary. Um, so what I'll do is I'll start though by talking about the, sort of the key role that schools and colleges already play in supporting children and young people's mental health and wellbeing. And then I'll talk through the importance of a holistic approach so that whatever provision schools are already offering, it can be enhanced and it can be developed. And then at the end of the webinar, I'll be back again and I'll finish off by sharing some information about the Department for Education's funded training to help develop the role of senior mental health lead in schools and colleges across the country. So that's uh, that's an overview of what I'll be covering. So why is there a need to develop and embed a culture that supports children and young people with their mental health and well-being? Well, I thought it made sense if I began by setting the scene for the mental health picture um, by sharing these recently published statistics. So in 2022, 18% of children aged 7 to 16 years had a probable mental disorder, which is an increase from 12% in 2017. And I think that statistic really makes clear the prevalence of cases for young people and that recent increase reflecting the impact of the pandemic and lockdown on the mental health of children, and young people, as well as, of course, other factors. More recently, the cost of living crisis, for instance. And then the second statistic, half of all mental health problems are established by the age of 14. I find that that one really quite stark. I think it really puts a spotlight on how vital mental health and well-being support in childhood is. So in school, therefore, represents a really key time to work to prevent these widespread negative impacts before the issues escalate. So if we can get it right in childhood with a focus on prevention and early, early intervention, then we can really reap the benefits now, but also in the years to come. Um, and then just to follow on from these statistics, I think it's, it's really clear that, that schools can play a crucial role in this preventative approach. Um, and facilitating mental health and wellbeing promotion and support through education settings then, of course, is going to be key. Schools, you know, they're there, they're working directly with the children, and young people in these formative years of their lives. You know, teachers, you are the professionals, you the ones who know the children, you know the families, you know the communities that you work with, and you're going to make that early identification far more effective rather than services only being accessed when issues have already escalated and become more critical and reach the stage where referrals are needed. 
However, when referrals are needed, families are often far more likely to access these wider services if it's done through a school that they trust rather than necessarily going directly. If they if if there may be a stigmas, I, think, I know exist in a lot of communities. So schools are a trusted body. And I think they can really help link up education and health. Oh, I didn't mean to press that. That's the trouble with some of these. Let me get the right button. There we go. Um, so this this diagram here, I think will. If, you have, if you're not familiar with it, it's the whole school approach framework in this kind of wheel diagram. But it's whole school approach is the fundamental way that we can get holistic and really sustainable mental health and wellbeing support to as many children and young people as possible, not just targeted individuals who've been targeted because maybe they've reached a more, a more serious stage. It's about the, the wider reach. And it, it might vary amongst you how familiar you are with the eight principles of a whole school approach and with the limited time now I'm not going to talk through each principle one by one, but I wanted to point out the importance of buy in from school leadership that's why it's there in the middle of the diagram, but because really for holistic change to happen in a school mental health and well being has to be a valued priority by the leadership. And by leadership, I don't just mean the head teacher, the principal, I mean the wider senior leadership team, maybe the governing body or trustees um, middle leaders as well. You know, one staff member alone cannot change the ethos and approach of a school. For instance, if you're going to make curriculum and policy changes, that can only be made if there are whole school decisions which feed down into daily practice. You know, if the plans and priorities for staff CPD and parental engagement are being done, you're plotting out for the year, you can't you can't do it in an ad hoc way. You have to do it with sort of short, medium, long term whole school plans. Student voice as well. You can be having you know surveys and school councils and things like that but it's only really going to be meaningful if it can bring about a change in practice at the school i think the other thing about ethos as well is to point out is that signs that a young person is struggling might not be identified unless all the staff are trained is there a culture at your school to pass on even the tiniest concerns no matter how small and um i often reference here when i was in the school in islington the staff Became in the later years really, really skilled at spotting those tiny, tiny signs that might just be the slightest change in how a child's presenting, whether their mood has just shifted slightly or um, their behaviour isn't how you would normally know it to be, or a tiny comment that's passed. And that sort of thing would trigger colleagues to pass on their concerns. It all creates a picture about how that child's doing, and then the right support can be put in place. But of course, for the support to be put in place, you do need the leads, school leads, to um, be able to work collaboratively with health colleagues so they can sort of triage what the right support for particular needs might be. And an education staff is really, you know, when you're, you're being pulled from pillar to post, you can't be expected to have your finger on the pulse to know exactly what services are out there. And that's why that need for health and education to come together and support each other, these two sectors and their professionalism and expertise to come together is really going to what's what's going to push mental health provision in schools forward. Um, this is a very busy slide. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail for how busy this slide is, but it's, I thought it's worth sharing really just to re for reference, because when you're exploring your whole school approach to mental health and wellbeing, it's really useful to view it through this framework of the eight principles and acknowledging the fact that absolutely no school, of course, is starting from zero. There's already a lot of really fabulous practice under all these eight areas. Um, but if you're looking to develop it further, whether that be your curriculum, it might be increasing your student voice about mental health and wellbeing needs, it might be working more with your parents and carers, or maybe monitoring the impact of the interventions that you run at your school. But the point is that having a plan for how your school can move forward in its provision will be far more impactful. As with any area of school development, the smart, effective approach is to have a strategic action plan that guide the work you do, rather than being ad hoc or reactive into your approach with the issues that are just sort of arriving at your front door or your office door every day. But having a lead in that particular area, a senior mental health lead, means you've got someone to be that driving force. Um, and shortly you'll be hearing some examples from some people who've been leading the schools about what they've been implementing. And as you listen, I would urge you to kind of bear in mind how all this, whatever varied work they've done, it will inevitably fit under these principles. So even if whole school approach doesn't look the same in any two schools, there will be consistency in how the best practice will be multifaceted. And that this framework is a really brilliant way of looking at the provision and how you might develop it further. Um, I'll just finish up with a few more things worth sharing a few resources. 
This resource here contains case studies from uh, mental support teams across the country with examples of good practice, which are specific to each of the eight principles of a whole school approach. So it's worth having a read of that if there's a particular one of the eight principles that you want to explore how you could develop it further. It's available online if you're already signed up to the Future NHS Collaborative platform. And there's a link there which is embedded in the slides that you'll get. But if, if not, um, it's going to be shared around with the slides as well as a document, as an attachment. And then also I wanted to just draw your attention to the fact that um, at the Department for Education, we're currently in development are two other resources to help support with the whole school approach. One is an online hub, which is going to host a wide range of practical and evidence informed resources for mental health leads. And the other is a toolkit which will help schools and colleges to identify options and develop their targeted pastoral support offer for pupils and students with social, emotional, mental health needs. So they're going to be available later this year. And just before I finish, because I think I'm probably coming to the end of my time slot, but um, just before I finish, I thought um, yesterday I shared a quote from um, a head teacher that I heard speaking just this week in the London Borough of Havering. And um, she has said that she had just had Ofsted at her school. And when the inspectors spoke to some of the children, which, as you know, um, from working in schools, those of you who do, um, they will always speak to a group of children. And a question they near enough, I think, always ask is, would you know who to speak to if you're worried about something? And this head teacher explained that one little girl answered by reeling off the names of many people in, in various roles across the school that she could go to speak to. But then she finished by saying, but I wouldn't need to, because at this school they would spot that something wasn't right and would have already come to help me. And when I heard that, I just felt so reassured. I thought that quote, that quote right there is exactly what a whole school approach um, looks like when it's at its best. So I thought that would be quite a positive, nice note to finish on. And I'll hand back to Jackie and stop sharing my screen. Thanks. Um, I'm mental health lead at the Melbourne curriculum leader Spanish and I am MFL teacher and key stage five form tutor. So I see I see a lot of students, um, which give me a very, very broad um, picture of the whole thing. Um, if we can skip those uh, and that one as well, you already have my background, this is fine. So what I want you to talk, what I want today to talk to you about is the whole school approach um, in terms of mental health and well-being at St Melbourne. What we do, what is working for us, what challenges are we facing and what we want to do with that. We go to the next slide. I got a lot to say, so I'm going to keep it short. Um, can you, so the first thing that we do is have a poll, um, as Kirsty was saying before, making sure that um, the leadership and management is involved. So the school ethos and the environment, the whole SLC, not only the SLC, but from the receptionist to the head teacher and the governors, there is an environment of respect and kindness first um, to all the students and try to listen to them first. Um, so, so we are sure that we develop the student as a whole, and we are not only focusing on the academics, um, but also as a person as a whole. In terms of um, how mental health is fitted into the curriculum and the teaching and learning, we do this through PSHE sessions for all geo groups, where we do awareness on mental health and also um, other um, other sessions of more specific mental health illness and how to help your friends and stuff like that. And um, part of the Curricular, extracurricular activities we offer um, is anti-bullying ambassadors, well-being club, mental health society or six form body program. So we have, we make sure that not only within the curriculum, but also in our extracurriculars, our curricular activities, the students have a whole um, different, all different aspects of, of mental health and how to, to look after themselves. Um, when it comes to student voice, we think it's very, very important we have been trying to do a resilient survey for the past two years, and recently we have joined um, the Anti-Bullying um, Alliance survey, which is being it's proving very, very useful. And we have developed a reporting tool, an anonymous reporting tool, um, in case students have problems with bullying, unkind behaviour, discriminatory language, or concerns about someone's well-being. And especially for key stage three students, it has been very helpful to raise concerns about their peers, um, which we think is, is very, very important. Um, carrying on with the lovely wheel that Kirsty was mentioning before, um, obviously we, 
work with our staff and it's very very important that they are on board and um, so we practice we have had insights about how to help the students with their mental health and um, we do reflective groups um, led by mine we're very very lucky to have the mental health support team um, from mine um, and they come and do work with us as, um, as a staff with students and with teachers so we're very very happy and very very lucky to have them and um, and we have used the the um, department for education grant funding we have used it to do a restorative practice um, as a way to have a cpd opportunity and what we have done um, is using it with more than one person so we all like three members of the safeguarding and pastoral team join um, to to use that money to 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 educate ourselves about restorative practice so we're not focusing only on the mental health, but also like how to help the student when the when the mental health has affected their their behavior and their um, their way to to talk to other people. Um, in terms of I think so yeah, identifying needs and monitor. I have it a different monitor here. Um, as a whole staff principle, we practice care. So being as Anna Freud put in their lovely video, practicing being curious, approachable, refer and empathy. Every member of the staff have access to CPOMs and um, where we can, and also to the safeguarding team um, email. So we can all see, um, we can all refer to them if we're worried about them. And um, so we are making sure that everyone in the staff is involved in it. And um, more specifically, heads of year safeguarding team, counselors and mentors are more specifically um, targeted to, to find what the needs are and also obviously monitoring how, how the needs of the students are, are being developed and they are being um, looked after. So for that, we normally use, um, in terms of deciding the most appropriate support, we use RAS meeting, which is referral assessment and support meeting, um, that they are done by key, by key stage, key stage three, key stage four, key stage five, and we look at the specific cases raised by the safeguarding team, well, raised to the safeguarding team through CPOMs or to the um, safeguarding email. We are in the middle of a transition. And um, so we decide what's the best help um, that we can offer to the student because we have different ones. And last one um, is working with parents and carers. And um, as a secondary school, we find that a bit more challenging at times. Um, but we try to keep our parents and carers um, aware of, of mental health and the importance of mental health um, through the monthly bulletin. Um, we do signpost it to, to relevant resources, not only with a parent approach, but sometimes we see the, the students having a problem. We target the, the parent and we try to do also targeted um, workshops, which is more or less. So this is in general what we are doing at the moment. Um, and yeah, we go to the next one, maybe. Yes, I read top one. And so, what is working for us? So, obviously, I cannot be in charge of all of that. <laughs> I am mental health lead, but I cannot, I have no eyes, I have no capacity to be in charge of all of that and looking after all of that. So, the important thing is that everything um, is shared. So, Mental health provision um, for the whole school needs coordination, but we delegate, we have different roles. So me as a mental health coordinator, the mental health support team provision for one-to-one -one sessions, small groups, assembly workshops. And man I manage also the um, six form bodies um, and supervise and support the mental health society club and special campaigns like Hello Jello or Mental Health Aware next week. Then the safeguarding lead for mental health coordinates all the referrals to CAMS and, and other external agencies, agencies we work with, such as the MIX or Anna Freud, for instance. And we have the school counsellors who are um, able to see the student and that see those students whose needs need overpass the threshold for low mood um, or anxiety. Um, no, sorry the school counsellor to see the students who overpass it and the school mentors who see the students who 
don't go to that threshold. So they are not, they need help, but they are not just that to that, that threshold. And obviously the mental health support team from mine, um, who are an elderly health service, um, and they work with the students one-to-one -one or offering more specific targeted workshops. So all of them is working for us. The SLT obviously is very understanding and very supportive, otherwise I couldn't do any of this. Um, and the student parents and carers are always aware of everything that is, is happening. Um, we have also a clear mental health provision so everyone can access to the information if they need it. We have a document for all the pastoral team um, that is clearly explained where, what help is provided by who and what specific cases each of that help will be targeted to. Um, and we also have for students and parents like a, like a slide to make them aware also of that provision. So it's not only a document that we keep, but it's also a document that parents and carers and students can see. So clear information about um, provision share also with the staff um, through the, the inset. And obviously training and information is given on how to identify mental needs, mental health needs, and where to find support for our students and for um, the staff as well. So that is in terms of, and I need to be quick, so challenges that we are facing, turn, turn, turn. Obviously everyone has challenges. <laughs> Helping students and staff to identify mental health issues and distinguishes them from day-to-day -day feelings. That's one of the hardest, I don't know my other colleagues, but that's one of the hardest challenges that we have. And um, providing help for students who have been referred to external agencies, but are facing very long waiting lists. Like what can we do in the meantime for them? is also very challenging for us. And as you can see, managing all the different professionals and opportunities available to our students, sometimes it becomes a bit too much, but we do what we can, and that is what is important. So where do we want to go next? So keep providing all the help um, we can with the resources we have, as it says there, um, keeping providing meaningful resources, not only, um, not only for teachers, but also for students, obviously. Continue to focus on creating resilience and independence in students who have already received the support. So give them the independence to make sure that we give them the independence to continue without that extra support and continue improving access to information for staff and students about self-care and well-being. And that's it. Thank you very much. Presentation. I've come from a very different angle from Carmen. I've been very fortunate in that um, I've been able to work in the collaborative um, cluster approach for the last five years. So I'm basically going to talk, talk you through that, that fortunate process, but I'm also going to explain to you what we do at Tolworth as a result of this collaborative approach. So if we look at the next slide. Um, OK, so we've got 16 schools working together across all phases. So we've got primary schools, we've got secondary schools, single sex, mixed, and we've got primary um, special school who work with us. And over the last four to five years, we've developed incredibly close relationships with all of these practitioners. Um, so, I mean, very, very fortunate. And it started small. We started off with um, one school, which was us. Then we started off with six schools. And it was basically on the premise of we are all having to be experts in mental health. And what we first saw was that each of us was developing the wheel and we needed to share our experiences. So it was all about um, if we needed um, expertise in a certain area, one of the schools would be able to provide that rather than us having to kind of uh, manage the need. Um, and then we eventually became 16 schools. So what we've done is very much focus on how we can help um, and what can we do to support you as in the cluster um, to make things easier because every single one of us is experiencing the need around anxiety, parental anxiety, suicidal ideation, um, self-esteem, even in schools in primary sector and the one that's coming out from us in terms of the special school is the kind of fact that students who have got special educational needs there's a lack of acceptance that they also may have mental health needs that are not associated with their special educational need. So we've been doing a lot of work with our 16 schools and you can see who we've been working with. It's been fascinating, um, but so not easy to put together 
but amazing to put together because when we meet the collective, everybody is so keen to share and we meet once a month and we meet once a half term. And even during COVID, we met regularly and we were able to work with each other on, you know, mental health uh, approaches to students who weren't able to get into school or vulnerable parents. So if we look at the next slide. OK, so this is the kind of work that we've been working on, but if we take it um, sort of from the top down, really, um, just showing the power of togetherness and our whole ethos and our whole um, reason for being is about resilience, not reliance. And it's about um, developing the students' power to deal with mental health. Because Carmen said, if you've got a broken arm, you put a cast on it and you have a support, you know, support for that arm. And what we've said to the, the pupils and the parents and our staff is, yeah, everybody has mental health. Everybody has mental health and obviously in various degrees. But how are we going to do things to support you? And I, when I do assemblies, I talk about my own mental health and the fact that I've had CBT and I'm wearing, I don't know if any of you know, a twanger. So when I become quite anxious, which I am at the moment because <laughs> I'm doing a presentation, I use my twanger and that's my way of dealing with my anxiety because we all have it. You know, we all get earache, we all get upset tummy, we all get cold or flu. So at this moment in time, I am twanging away quite happily on my wrist to cope with my anxiety. So the focus is on um, resilience, not reliance. And obviously there are some young people who need more support to develop that. So if we take it from the top, we basically um, have developed a policy when we first started and that's now being rewritten. I didn't rewrite it. One of our local schools did. And it's now got a lot of work around sharing excellence and looking at suicide and suicide ideation because we've all been part of um, a support group within Kingston to look and Richmond at how we can support our students, especially with that particular issue. So we've developed this policy, which we've now implemented in our school and other schools, if they want to, can implement that too. We've also looked at our admissions policy and our admissions paperwork, and we've shared how when young people join our schools we interview the young people when they come with their parents on the interview form it's got has your child ever had an SEND need are they pupil premium have they got um, a musical or an ability you know amazing ability um, have they got a medical issue and what we've done is we've also included now mental health so it's optional you don't have to fill in any of those parts of the form but it does say um, have you has your child ever had support for mental health issues it's quite open it's quite you know what we're trying to do is remove the stigma the parent fills it in we gather that information together but there is another bit of information on that form is have you ever had uh, a mental health issue and what type of support do you feel you would need to a support your child or b support um, yourself because going further on in, the, in a minute to talk to you we're developing volunteer work for our parents so that's something that we've put in and we're sharing with um, all of the schools across Kingston and Richmond because it was something that was identified about taking the stigma away um, we work very closely with our primary schools on the transition and I know that happens in all schools but it's about early identification and because we've got such close relationships with our local schools because of the work we're doing in clusters um, they're quite happy to share information and I think last year we had 30 young people who joined us who had identified mental health needs so right from the get-go we were able to put res resilience programs in place for them. We also have support for our parents, our pupils and our staff. Um, one of the things we've put in in terms of practices is we have self-harm protocols. So that's again shared across our cluster. So we have like a checklist of if a child does this, what do you do? If a child does that, what do you do? Quite happy to share all of this with you. And it means that you, um, every member of staff feels confident about what happens if a child is um, self-harming. We also have a triage. If there's an incident with a young student who has a mental health incident or mental health issue, then there's a triage um, sort of framework that we use. And again, that was developed by another school which we borrowed everyone's quite happy to share and um, we're quite happy to share that with you as well we also have had mental health um, training for all of our staff and that's across the piece but all 45 members of my staff are trained as first 
mental health first aiders and that's not just teaching staff that is all staff and anybody who wants to do it so it's about early identification as you said Carmen about noticing things that suddenly change for that young person so that you can immediately put support in place um, for them. In terms of um, support in the school and for the pupils we have got a mental health lead as she coordinates the approaches for each student and it's early identification and tracking and I'm just going to reel off some of the things we do because because of this cluster because of this joint um, approaches we are able to offer so much so curriculum focus we are working on a joint PSHE program across the the schools and looking at how we can support each other so I might have an expert who can deliver something around working with ASD which they, we have and the primary's got an expert in ASD as well so we're now working together on the neurodiversity work um, and support and we've also got a, a secondary school in Kingston who's doing a huge amount of work with that so I'm quite happy to um, share that person's link as well. Um, in terms of the young people, we've got a readiness group for our year sevens in terms of transition. We've got a talk about group for year eight and they sit and talk. We have Lego therapy where the young people are developing social skills. We have the chill out club, which is really lovely because it's young people who find socialization difficult, who find being in secondary school quite difficult um, and they meet, have their lunch. They watch a video, they watch a film and they make friends. And it's just so amazing. Um, that happens twice a week. We have a social thinking club um, which focuses on friendships. And, you know, people don't like me. I haven't got any friends. And we, we work with um, young people on that, especially around our ASD and our ADHD students as well. We've got nurture groups. We work with young carers. Um, we've got a team of student support workers who work with our students, their well-being and uh, mental health. And... They do one on one work or they do one on school and um, one on um, one to one school work and we do talking therapy. We do one on one therapy. We have art therapy. We have quiet zones within school where young people can take themselves. We have some key groups within school who deliver assembly. So we've got our LGBTQI plus plus group. We've got our um, different groups. Um, we've got our people of colour groups who talk about mental health assemblies. So everybody's involved. Um, and then we focus work at the moment, we're focusing our work with local volunteering services to look at how we can develop approaches into st with students who've got ADHD because they seem to have fallen off the radar and it's quite prevalent when young students are misbehaving or they've got issues in classroom instead of you thinking they are naughty or they've got bad behavior what we're finding is they've got ADHD and there's lots of it going on at the present in the press at the moment about what ADAD and ADHD and lots of um, older people like myself, are coming you know coming out I suppose and saying yes I have got ADHD so we're looking at processes around that in terms of our parental support, um, we, again, because we're in this cluster, we're able to work with so many different parents. So if we have a suicidal ideation information evening, we can invite the parents from other schools. We've also had healthy eating, irregular ha eating habits because of during COVID that came out as a thing. Eating disorder, had to cope with that. So I would go ask schools would go to another school where that would be hosted. Um, we've got emotional distress groups who are offered to parents um, who are finding things very difficult. How do they cope with their own mental health as well as how do they cope with their young person's mental hope? We've also got URSA support groups with young people and parents. So if they're finding access to school difficult, we've got a whole pad of stuff that we can give to parents about getting them up in the morning, about routines. We have coffee mornings where people can sit and talk. Um, and then we have events days like our young people have hosted for their parents how to deal with them in terms of their ADHD and what they want in terms of ASD. Um, and that's been hosted by parents and they provide tea and coffee and they wear badges and they do posters and they're basically educating our parental community. And um, we've got time to talk for parents and we're now working with the voluntary agencies within our cluster to look at a directory for parents. Um, what we're trying to do is make it a directory of um, people to talk to rather than people to look at, because the worst thing when you've got mental health is you want somebody to speak to. You don't want it to be a piece of paper or a, a screen. You want to speak. So we're working with our mental uh, voluntary services on that. Um, for staff, 
we've done mental health first aid, as I've said, massive work on raising awareness of their mental health. We've redone our staff room. So there are some sofas and blankets and um, places where it smells beautiful and they can sit and relax. Um, we have um, events every every um, so often where we share tea, coffee, time to talk. We have monthly events where how are you feeling? And that's not fine. How are you feeling? Do you want to chat? that kind of thing and the young people are doing it as well so when I walk past the uh, main foyer how are you feeling miss and you can't think I'm feeling fine because they won't accept it you have to just well I've had such a bad day and you say you know and I'm twanging away and you talk about your own mental health sorry I know I don't know if that's the right word but I am twanging um and we have um food events and we've done Zumba and we also brought in um last year after Covid a mental health um inset day where staff can do what they like in terms of developing their own mental health um, so they can stay at home in their fluffy pajamas, their, um, wear their fluffy socks, drink nice tea and coffee, eat cake, or they can do some more work about mental health, or they can just clear their everyday life, so they actually can focus on their own mental health and spend the day at home. Um, in terms of where we've got, we have coffee and cake and inset and all sorts of things taking place, we've reduced our meeting time to one hour. Um, we've got safe spaces where people can talk. We've got counsellors um, and it's the more you talk about it. And I've spoken to Jackie about this in the past, the more you remove the stigma. And my concern was the more we talk about it, are we making it that people have to have it? But the reality is we've all got it. We've all got mental health. And what we're doing is removing the stigma, you know, and the amount of young people I meet and they say I'm having such a bad day or I'm having an off day. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling and you, you they're just so happy to talk about it. In terms of where next, um, one of the major things that's come out for us as a group and as a school is the increased risks we're carrying as a school. Um, because there are so many young people who are suffering from mental health, sadly. So we've been involved in a massive project with the NHS. Um, we wrote to them, we raised their concern, our concerns, and there's somebody who's part of the group, Stuart, has been doing an awful lot of work for me on looking at the communication between um, the NHS and um, us in terms of what we know. So we're looking at a, a, a comm strategy, we're looking at training school nurses, we're looking at what we can do to support young people who whilst they are waiting for CAMS and their expectations about CAMS, um, so like a virtual waiting room. Um, we're looking at how A&E and GPs can inform us better when a young person has an incident so that we can put a risk assessment and work in place. Um, as I said, it's been done an audit provision around um, the what we know, what we don't know. We're also ordering provision around risk and best practice. So we're doing some work with our um, CAMS team to see which schools have got best practice and how we can share that best practice through the NHS. And we are basically setting up various groups with the NHS so that we can actually get more support into preventative work and they're actually giving us money to do that so it is about I think my message to you is about joining up with the people around you each of you in a school has tremendous amount of knowledge and I, I'm blown away every time I meet my colleagues about what they're doing and what they've got in place and you know the seating arrangements for young people who don't have friends in primary school and the use of the LSAs and ELSA and that's in isolation but what we've done is we've not isolated it we've put it all together so I know I can phone uh, a local primary school and say look we've got an issue around an ASD and a young child who's got serious SEND issues who's under his age appropriate and could you give us some advice and no problem of course I will give you some help and we arrange meetings and the other thing is around our special school um, supporting them uh, and really kind of banging the drum that yeah the, the students are at a special school but they do have mental health issues as well. And CAMS are now beginning to realise that and the NHS are working on that as well. Um, sure. Thank you. So One last last there minute. we are. Okay. Um, talking to you about the opportunity to have a trained senior mental health lead in your setting, if, for those of you who are working in a school. Um, but if you're not and you work with schools, please, um, it's also worth you understanding the offer because um, we would urge you to uh, schools you work with to take this opportunity and that is that um so to have a senior mental health lead in your school is not a compulsory role however i think people are recognizing schools are recognizing the need for it really um the issues are there having somebody like we've talked about today um driving things forward is is really essential 
Um, but it's really important to be clear that it is not the person who is the senior mental health leader is absolutely not expected to be a clinician and not expected to be the expert in mental health. They're just I suppose going to be the advocate for it, the ambassador, if you like, and and to be the, the leader, have the leadership skills. So it's quite comparable in many ways to being um, a SENCO, where you don't expect the SENCO to understand all the different complex special educational needs that are going on in their school. And they're not expected to run all the interventions for those children. But much like a SENCO, you would expect the senior mental health lead to facilitate. So they want to facilitate the effective practice across the school. So working with external professionals, ensuring that the staff training is really kept up to date, managing interventions, working with parents, that sort of thing. So just to clarify that about the role. Um, and it's just raising awareness that there is um, a grant for um, eligible state funded schools. So that's primary, secondaries and colleges across England for £1,200 per setting. If you weren't aware, it, it's there, is it DfE funded? And then there are over 100 quality assured courses to choose from. So um, at the moment, I think in December, when we last sort of took a, a data cut of it, I think about 47% of eligible settings across London have claimed the grant, which is lower than the national take up which is around about 50 percent at the time um so there's lots of schools that aren't taking this opportunity and that's why i really want to kind of raise the awareness because we want the children and young people to be benefiting from the best whole school approach that there is but all the training is underpinned by the eight principles of whole school approach regardless of the course that um, a delegate will choose to go on so that's why we keep um coming back to those eight principles but just a bit of um, kind of practical information about it is that, yeah, there are over 100 courses to choose from and it's about finding the right fit for the person going on the course. So depending on your, you can just sort of filter your search by the level of expertise, whether you see yourself as a beginner, intermediate or advanced, um, different time commitments from them. Some are face to face, some are online, some hybrid maybe a particular education setting type and focusing on that might suit some people um, and they have slightly different costs and different price brackets and the majority of them fall under the £1,200 grant which gives a bit of surplus for the school or college to then spend that maybe on supply cover or some resources to support the provision. All the links you would need are embedded in these slides so when they're shared with you um, it should make it as easy as possible to find out exactly how you claim the grant but it's a simple, I say simple, I think it's really, I'm trying to break it down to be as simple as possible. It's a three step process, essentially. Step one is you just click on the link here, which takes you to form one. And that is where you enter your school details and your details. And that tells you whether you're eligible or not. And then if you are, it essentially holds that £1,200 in a pot ready earmarked for your school. You can then spend some time um browsing the courses and choosing the one that's the best fit for you. And if you do get that right, people come out the other side absolutely, you know, raving about the course. Um, so and then once you've booked it, you click on um, form two, which is the final step and you upload your booking confirmation and then that triggers the payment to come to your setting. Um, and they're made every quarter, the payment. So it will reach you maximum. You'd wait, it'd be three months if you just missed a payment window. And I, I, I promise I'll be quick. Um, it's just, we've had lots of people now completed the course and they're coming out really positive. So many of them, especially when they've found a good match for them. Um, I think I won't, I read through, I'll read through one very, very quickly. Um, by pulling together everything we were already doing as a school community and making a few small but impactful changes, I was able to make sure that we are fully covering the eight aspects of a whole school approach to mental health and wellbeing. The school now has an improved support offer and the training has been truly helpful in identifying areas where more work is needed over the next year. And that was from um, a senior mental health lead in Hampshire. And I was on a call, a, um, a nice little soundbite from a senior mental health lead in Cheshire last week who said that in her 15 years of teaching, the course she had done for a senior mental health lead training was the best she'd been on. So I think that that shows that if you can pick the right course, you will come out really thriving with enthusiasm for what you can do and what change you can bring about at your school. So I'll stop there and we probably have just a few minutes for some final questions for me or other speakers today.